Welcome everybody to the Interstate Chemical Clearing House webinar, Best Practices for Safer Cleaning and Disinfecting. We'll be starting in a few minutes. Before we actually just get started, I wanted to mention a couple of the webinar logistics. This is a 90 minute webinar, um, so it's comprising approximately, we'll have 45 minutes of the speakers and then um, 15 minutes for question and answer that Andy Bray from IC2 NUMO is going to moderate. And then um, we will also have an additional 30 minutes for discussions and sharing of resources. And that's going to be moderated by Kevin Masterson from Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, who is the chair of the Interstate Chemical Clearing House training team. Um, all lines are going to be muted. And um, if you have questions, please post them into the question interface. And if you have a specific speaker that you want to address the question, please put their name so it's easier to moderate and identify who to first answer the question. If you have any technical questions, please let us know through the chat interface. And then um, a recording will be posted on the Interstate Chemical Clearinghouse website, and the link is here. And um, please share this with as many people as you think will be interested. We really appreciate your attendance and distribution. And your feedback is important to us. We'll have a survey at the end of this webinar. Um, so please fill it out. And um, Andy, uh, you might want to make sure that you're on mute um, when the speakers, I think that's you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so this is all, all, all the early part. Oh, maybe not. Um, but um, yeah, so basically at this point in time, hopefully um, we'll, we'll start the webinar. So welcome everybody to the Interstate Chemical Clearing House webinar, Best Practices for Safer Cleaning and Disinfecting. My name is Suske Van Bergen. I work at the Washington State Department of Ecology. I'm also part of the Interstate Chemical Clearing House training team. And the Interstate Chemical Clearing House is an association of state, local, and tribal governments that promote a clean environment, healthy communities, and a vital economy through the development and use of safer chemicals and products. And there are a number of goals of the IC2. They are to enhance efficiency and effectiveness of agency initiatives on chemicals, build capacity to identify and promote safer chemicals and products, as well as to ensure ready access to high quality chemicals data, information and assessment methods. And the website is at the bottom if you wanna learn more. Andy, I can't get the next slide. We have um, a great panel of speakers for you today. Uh, we really would thank you for joining us. Uh, this topic is very important and timely, and we hope you're safe. And we know there are a lot of questions on this issue, so I feel very privileged to introduce you to our speakers. Nancy Simcox from the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences from the University of Washington. Alicia Culver from the Responsible Purchasing Network. And then finally, Julia Singer from King County Hazardous Waste Management Program. So with that, I present to you, Nancy. Thank you, Saskia. I'm now transitioning. Do I have control yet, Andy? Yes, you do, Nancy. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to now go next. Andy, I can't seem to go next. Okay, thank you. Nancy Simcox here. Um, I oversee the uh, NIOSH Education and Research Center at the University of Washington, the Northwest Center for Occupational Health and Safety, as well as the Northwest, Northwest Pacific OSHA Education Center. And I'm happy to be here today to talk about safer cleaning and disinfecting practices, especially as many of you are returning to work um, and developing your uh, return to work plans. Next, please. So today we're gonna to cover 
some brief resources for you um, as you develop return to work plans. Uh, go over the health impacts of cleaning and disinfecting some of the associations, as well as applying the hierarchy of controls and understanding the safer cleaning practices that should be going on during the pandemic, but also um, routinely as you uh, continue when there isn't a pandemic. Next, please. So since the pandemic started, the CDC has provided guidance for cleaning and disinfecting, important information that has been available for workplaces that are open and essential. And now as we reopen across the country, the CDC developed a decision tool for cleaning and disinfecting uh, for public spaces, workplaces, businesses, schools, and homes. And these tools can help you um, ask the right questions um, as you put together effective cleaning and disinfection plans. So first, as you are ready to be consistent with your state and local rules, as well as ready to protect employees at higher risk for severe illness. And so once you can answer these questions um, for your workplace, you can move on. And there's a this tool will guide you through a variety of um, good resources. And I have the link down there on the bottom of the slide for you. Next, please. So why are we here? Um, one of the reasons is because the COVID-19 virus. And um, when you're starting to disinfect and clean um, workplaces, we want to have a better understanding of what is the virus or the pathogen that we're trying to um, get rid of from the workplace. So the SARS-CoV-2 is the pathogen that causes the disease COVID-19. It's a new strain of human coronavirus. The coronaviruses are enveloped virus, meaning they have a protective membrane of fat. It is susceptible to heat, and we know that the cleaners and dis disinfectants are able to dissolve the outer protective layer of that fat. Um, the soap molecules actually compete with the lipids in the virus membrane. And the spiky protein uh, on the virus also increases from this transmissibility. Next, please. So as our businesses reopen, we want to, to help you all think about things that you have to put into your return to work plans. And you are all very familiar now with the practicing of physical distancing, hand hygiene, mask and face coverings, health monitoring, but now we wanna focus a little bit more on the cleaning and disinfecting. Next, please. So Washington State was the first to report the first case of COVID-19 on January 19th, 2020. Since then, everyone's been cleaning and disinfecting with chemicals as a first response. You can he see here um, that the daily number of calls to poison control centers increased sharply at the beginning of March for exposures to both cleaners and disinfectants. The increase in calls showed that leeches accounted for the largest percentage of the increase among the cleaner categories, whereas household non-alcohol disinfectants and hand sanitizers accounted for the largest percentage of increase among the disinfectant categories. So this was a concern as soon as we, as we started to think about how we want to clean and disinfect. Next, please. So some of the health effects associated with cleaning include causing asthma or making it worse. And asthma is a condition where a person's airways become inflamed, narrow, and swell, making it really difficult to breathe. Other effects include irritating of the skin, eyes, nose, throat, causing headaches. Uh, there's research showing that they disrupt or act like hormones, cause cancer, as well as reproductive effects. Next, please. So some of the chemicals of concern so that are in cleaners are and I put cleaning products as a general category because many of the early studies that we have have often showed that cleaners are lumped together and they didn't really specify what exactly um, were the ingredients in those products. And so studies of workers using cleaners face a lot of exposure assessment challenges because a lack of complete information on products and their ingredients, as well as a lack of methods to measure multiple chemicals in the workplace. But the studies do show that cleaning products in a variety of work settings is a risk factor for adverse health effects, particularly respiratory and dermal. And some of the studies will actually have uh, specific product names and ingredients listed, such as sodium hypochlorite, the quaternary ammonium compounds, as well as other uh, products um, listed that you see on this slide. Thank you. Next. So one of the key things we see is there's strong evidence of respiratory disease among workers exposed to cleaning products. Rosenman 2020 used state surveillance systems 
confirming cases of work-related asthma over the past 10 years. And the workers involved were janitors, nurses, nurses' aides, and clerical staff. Other studies like Cummings also showed that occupational and domestic cleaning were associated with declines in lung function over the course of 20 years. And we know that custodial workers experience one of the highest rates of occupational asthma. And uh, as I said, Rosenman also mentioned that in the study. As do healthcare workers, I'd like to call out the Dumas longitudinal study because that one shows that the regular use of chemical disinfectants among nurses may be a risk factor developing to developing chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, and also uh, California's work-related asthma prevention program also had shown some reports that evidence of bystanders exposure to cleaning products also leads to asthma. Next, please. I'm providing this example uh, of a case that came in November of 2019 to highlight the importance of chemical mixtures. This incident happened where a worker was using um, sodium hypochlorite bleach on the floor and the floor actually had an acid already on it. And that caused a reaction between the two chemicals that made a deadly gas in the air. And the manager actually died in this case and the employees and customers had to go to the hospital. So these incidents are continuing to happen, which is why we want to focus on safer alternatives when we're looking at reopening our workplaces. Next, please. So what do we need? We need a systematic approach for controlling hazards, and that could lead us to, to prevention. And one of the things I was asked to talk about is um, the hierarchy of controls. Next, please. So as an industrial hygienist, um, I call your attention to the hierarchy of controls because this is an approach for reducing and removing hazards in the workplace. At the top of the, gra of the graph here, you can see the elimination and substitution. This is the most effective and most protective strategy. And by following this hierarchy, it can lead you to implementing safer systems when the risk of an illness to, re to where the risk or of illness or injury has been reduced. So with chemicals, for example, think about chemical-free systems for cleaning that eliminates the hazard right off the bat. Or if that is not possible, substitute, substitution should be considered. Replace a cleaning product that is associated with asthma with a safer alternative that doesn't cause asthma. You'll learn more about this from Alicia and our next speaker. And engineering controls, proper ventilation is very important to reduce chemical exposures, especially in confined spaces. Administrative controls, the way that people, you can help change the way people work, um, proper hand washing, for example. And then the least effective, which is the one that everyone tends to go to first, is personal protective equipment. And that one, you know, for chemical exposure, like having workers use gloves. So here's the hierarchy of controls, and we would like you to think about using this strategy when you're returning back to work and opening up. Next, please. So when I was first involved with the pandemic, I was receiving photos and, question, and questions from people asking me, well, what can we do here? Our workers are starting to have to clean a lot more. What are the, the, the protocols that we need to put into place? And so I saw an opportunity to work with a variety of other experts from the American Public Health Association, Occupational Health and Safety Section, the Washington Department of Health, Department of Ecology, Labor and Industries, Washington Labor and to put together a fact sheet that could just give people an approach and a bit and basic guidance for how to clean and disinfect and highlight some of these key things that we've been talking about. So here, if next please, here's an example of the fact sheet and you can actually um, scan the QR code there on there so that you can download it. Um, you can also go to our website at osha.washington.edu. But here it explains some key terms and best practices and as well as safer disinfectant options. Next, please. So some of the key terms we wanted to, everyone to understand that's important is that there's a big difference between cleaning and disinfecting. And you know, with cleaning, you're removing the germs, the dirt and impurities from it. You can use soap and water and a lot of friction. With sanitizing, you're reducing the germs on surface to certain levels. And with disinfectants, they actually destroy almost all infectious germs when used as the label directs. Uh, I want also, there's a, a mention that when you're doing this, you want to clean first and then disinfect. A lot of people are, are often out there now using disinfectants more as a cleaner, and they don't work if you're putting them on a surface that has already some kind of dirt or grime on it, because it doesn't, um, it disengages the, de deactivates your actual disinfectant if you put it on a dirty surface. 
Next, please. So I want to provide this guidance that it's at the CDC website that they put together. Um, it kind of helps you with getting your plan started. Uh, you can, um, it, and it walks you through a variety of questions that, that we want to talk about. And the link is down there at the bottom as well. Next, please. So developing your plan, these are the things we want to ask, like how, how often has the building, um, the area that you want to clean um, been occupied, especially for COVID-19 COVID situations. We want to know um, if it, you want to be able to have a set of written uh, standard operating procedures. You want to know when you're disinfecting, what is the high risk areas? What type of surface are you putting on? Because disinfectants work on different um, have different dwell times for being on a surface that to be able to work well. What kind of bacteria and virus are you using this for? Um, and also you wanna go through your workplace and identify frequently touched surfaces. Next, please. So, and of course, when you're starting off, you wanna say, what is the safer disinfectant? What can we do? And Leisha's gonna be talking with you about this and, how, and we'll walk you through the actual EPA registered disinfectant end list. Next, please. And I want to end with just extra resources and equipment that you need to think about when you're opening up and making sure that you're maintaining adequate ventilation when you're using chemicals. There's many new technologies out there now that have made cleaning a lot more easier for, for the workers as well as for employers to use. We want to make sure that you go to the CDC's website because there's questions about you know, UV radiation, for example, and what does that mean and what can be used. That's an example of a new technology. Um, dilution stations are out there that are available for people so they don't have to actually do the mixing themselves. There's no touch cleaning equipment uh, that workers need to uh, be trained on and able to use. Uh, they can be um, good for the workplace as well as microfiber mops and cloths and always using personal protective equipment. So this is all part of your plan that you need to put together and we can share more resources with you and talk with you more details at the end of the at the end of this. I'm going to now turn it over to Alicia. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and thank you, everyone, uh, for tuning in. And thanks to the Interstate uh, Chemicals Clearinghouse for hosting this important and obviously timely uh, discussion about safer cleaners and disinfectants against COVID-19. Um, I'm Alicia Culver. I'm the Executive Director of the Responsible Purchasing Network. And I'm gonna talk specifically about uh, the safer disinfectants uh, for use against the COVID-19 virus. Uh, next slide. Andy, I guess you're gonna have to advance because it doesn't seem like it's, there we go. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with um, uh, the Responsible Purchasing Network, uh, we're a 15-year-old organization um, based uh, now out in California. Um, we have members internationally, and we consist primarily of purchasing facility and sustainability professionals. Uh, we're the buyers rather than the sellers of products, and we share resources on a wide array of sustainable purchasing topics, um, including guidance on many, many different types of product categories, including green cleaners and safer disinfectants, um, as well as looking at sustainable purchasing policies, program design, um, and other uh, tools and resources. Next slide. I started um, looking at green cleaners actually before I was at RPN uh, when I was at an organization called Inform in New York. And this was 30 years ago. Um, we were trying to figure out, well, what makes a cleaner safer? And so we um, did in-depth research and came out with this report, Cleaning for Health Products and Practices for a Safer Indoor Environment. And we worked with many, many jurisdictions to try to implement um, their purchasing policies and practices for green cleaners. I'll talk about green cleaners at the end. Um, but then we kept coming up against this issue of, okay, the, the disinfectants can't be labeled as a green product, so often they were exempted from the policies and even the practices of even looking at them. But um, thanks to the um, proactive San Francisco Department of the Environment. Um, we took a couple of years, assembled a team, and really looked uh, closely 
at disinfectants uh, for government agencies and worked um, also with the Department of Public Health in San, in San Francisco to look at cleaning uh, disinfection and sanitizing for childcare centers, specifically looking at alternatives to bleach. So all of those resources are posted on our website if you're interested in, in seeing those. Next slide. So um, when things started really uh, revving up on the COVID situation, like Nancy got lots of questions, um, which disinfectants should I be using and seeing lots of recommendations for things that I um, think are questionable um, for uh, organizations to use. And so um, I started looking at the end list, which is the definitive list that both EPA and the Centers for Disease Control say is the list of disinfectants that are most likely um, to be effective against SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 um, virus. These products have not been tested specifically against this novel coronavirus, but many of them have been tested against human coronavirus or um, against uh, um, other pathogens, other viruses they think are similar or more um, difficult to kill, and that's how they end up on this list. Um, so um, I'm gonna walk you through how to use the list. Next slide. You can go to the EPA. If you type in EPA list and you'll get to it. So this is the home page landing page for the EPA's list N. And they've done a really good job at making it easy to um, navigate through it. You can search um, by EPA registration number, which is the most important thing um, to be using to figure out whether a product um, that you have is um, actually on this list. You can search by active ingredient. So if you're looking for a safer disinfectant, you can go in and search for hydrogen peroxide products. Um, you can search by other types of things, the name of the product using the keyword search, et cetera. Next slide. So I wanna just point out a few things. I did a couple screenshots of the list. Again, the most important thing is the EPA registration number. And the reason that this is very important is because some of the products when they're registered um, are registered under a different name than what you might see in the marketplace. And um, when I first started this, I was getting some of the organizations that I had worked with um, and who are using products like Oxavir, which is a hydrogen peroxide product or alpha HP disinfectant. And they're saying, ah, oh, these products are not on the list. But then we traced them back through the EPA registration numbers and they have different names when they were registered. So this is really important to, to, to check your products on EPA by the EPA registration number. Um, again, you can search, search by active ingredient. You can also search by product name, but just know that some products have a different name or they were private labeled. So that's um, not always the way that you're gonna be able to uh, find it. Next slide. Um, so when you're picking out different disinfectants, there may be some things that are important to you to be thinking about. One is, what is the contact time? How long do you need to leave that um, disinfectant wet, fully wet on the surface um, before uh, it's effective? And again, like Nancy said, you wanna clean first, then put the disinfectant on, and then um, you need to read the instructions to figure out, do you also need to wipe it off? Um, there are some studies now showing that the wiping is actually one of the most important things um, in terms of reducing the, um, uh, the amount of, of germs that are uh, remaining on the surface. Um, also, you might be looking at you know, do we want our RTU, which is ready to use product? Those often have a shorter dwell time, but they can be more expensive. Um, if you're just looking for wipes, we had one uh, person who asked about wipes for electronics, you can do search by wipes. So you can, or you can look at dilutable chemicals, which are gonna be your most cost effective um, products out there. Um, next slide. So um, once you have the EPA registration uh, label, there's a couple things that I think are important to look at. One is the safety data sheet for that product, but the other is going and finding 
what is called the EPA approved label for the disinfectant. So for any disinfectant to be able to claim it's a disinfectant, it has to get approval of the EPA. And the EPA will then um, give the, um, the most uh, current label for the product. And so what you can do is type in, like I did here, the EPA registration number for the product. Um, if it has anything after these two numbers uh, uh, with the dash, ignore them. So only the first two um, sets of numbers, um, they stand for the, the manufacturer and then its product name. Uh, uh, product number, excuse me. So if you do that, next slide, it'll take you to the actual EPA registration um, label for that product. So this is for the Oxy team disinfectant, which again is Oxivir, which I know a number of people um, and organizations are using uh, because it's effective um, and it doesn't have bleach or quats in it. Um, and you can then just pull up and click on the link to the label. It will give you all kinds of information about um, you know, how it's supposed to be used, what's the dwell time against multi the various different types of organisms, what kinds of PPE you need, et cetera. Next slide. Um, Nancy went through this, um, but I just wanted to emphasize that when we were doing our report, we were able to differentiate products uh, as a conventional disinfectant versus a safer disinfectant, one of the primary ways is, is the active ingredient, the ingredient that kills the germs um, on the surface, is that ingredient a known asthmogen? And two of the classes of chemicals that came out, um, chlorine bleach, which is known occupational asthmogen, it's also corrosive to the eyes and skin, it has a high aquatic toxicity, and it's usually in an open bottle, so there can be a lot of splashback um, issues with that product. Also, quats, quaternary ammonium compounds, not only the asthmogens, uh, they're the things that are often found concentrating in sewage sludge. They're the things that sometimes are creating superbugs, and they're typically corrosive and need to be rinsed off after they're used. Next slide. Or saying that um, CDC does say spraying those types of disinfectants and the aerosols into the air, completely ineffective um, way to use them. Okay, um, I just wanted to show this slide because we are asked all the time, how do we know that the chemical is an asthmogen? The definitive source is the Association of Occupational Environmental Clinics. They um, look at all the studies, they're constantly monitoring studies, and they're also looking at uh, all of the reports that come in about um, cases of occupational asthma, and then they maintain a list of chemicals that are um, asthmogens, and typically those will have an RS um, or a generally accepted or a RADS, which are just different types of um, asthma, the RADS versus the respiratory sensitization. Next slide. RADS is when you get asthma because there's a lot of scarring um, to the lungs. Um, and then I just wanted to connect this back to the COVID-19 uh, situation. Um, the CDC has um, said that there's a that asthma increases the risk of getting sick from COVID-19. We are all incredibly indebted to our facility staff that are going in, and they're really, in a lot of ways, frontline uh, responders who are cleaning and going to be even more cleaning as they're opening up our buildings um, to make sure that the people inside the building don't get sick. We want to do everything we can to protect them and not, um, you know, give them chemicals to work with that are going to cause them to get asthma, which then in turn um, becomes uh, one of the increased risk factors. If they do end up getting COVID-19 themselves, they can get they're at higher risk of getting sick. So um, I know we all want to do what we can to protect um, our custodial staff. Next slide. Yeah. Um, so safer disinfectants, um, typically uh, there's some resources that to point you to. One is the original study I talked about, the Safer Products and Practices uh, report that um, we did for 
um, San Francisco. Also, um, during the, si the same time period, the Design for the Environment program at EPA um, has been maintaining a project called the Antimicrobial Pesticide Products Pilot Test, and they also have been approving active ingredients that they um, uh, claim are safer. Mostly we agree, there's a couple places where we don't agree, but um, uh, we mostly agree on the ones that I'm going to talk about. Um, next slide. So the, the safer active ingredients, again, the pesticidal part of the disinfectant includes hydrogen peroxide, citric and lactic acid, and also ethanol. We didn't originally evaluate ethanol, but uh, the DFE program did, and we agree with them. So some of those products like uh, Purell, which I'll talk about, are in that category. Um, the health and environmental benefits of the safer disinfectants no carcinogens or reproductive toxins, no asthmogens or skin sensitizers. The chemicals break down safely in sewage and they are they may be irritating, but they're not corrosive to the eyes and skin, so they don't cause permanent damage. Next slide. Um, so we then came out with a new uh, resource where we looked at the end list of um, disinfectants that EPA approves and we have um, cross-referenced them to the ones that we um, approve of based on the safer disinfectant criteria. So I'm just going to quickly go through these. You can get a copy of it um, actually by linking to the, um, the fact sheet that Nancy talked about. So the first are the, um, the Clorox Commercial Solutions Hydrogen Peroxide Disinfectant Cleaners. Um, you can see the EPA registration numbers, but they, they're all ready to use. There's liquids and there's wipes, and they have a one-minute contact time. Next slide. The next group are similar. They're also ready-to-use products. They're by Diversi. They're the Oxivir ready-to-use disinfectant cleaners, typically called Oxivir um, TB. Uh, is, uh, and then there's also, they have a dilutable product, Oxivir 516, so if you're looking for a more cost-effective um, product. So against coronavirus, they uh, tend to have the ready-to-use, um, have a one-minute dwell time, and the Oxivir 516 has a five-minute dwell time. Next slide. And this is for, dis dis for disinfecting. Um, there's also, Diversity has another product uh, that we've approved, Alpha HP Multi-Surface Disinfectant Cleaner. There also is an all Alpha HP Multi-Surface Cleaner, so don't get those two mixed up, um, but that's an even more cost-effective product. It's dilutable with a 1 to 64 dilution, so if you're cleaning large areas, this could be more um, uh, effective. It has a five-minute contact time against coronavirus. Um, I was just looking at it yesterday, and it does have a 10-minute dwell time um, for other bacteria, so you want to not, you know, if you're, you're not just probably looking at um, at the coronavirus, you probably also want to, you know, consider some of the things that you have killed in the past, like staph infection and things like that. Next slide. Um, I also included on our list the Purell products. These are ready-to-use products. They're alcohol-based products. Um, they have a hard surface um, disinfectant, and um, they also come in wipes as well as uh, the liquids. Next slide. They have a five minute contact time. Um, so we've gotten a lot of questions about some of these alternative disinfectant methods. We're trying to continue monitoring them, but as Nancy said, go to the CDC guidance for the most updated information. Um, the CDC is saying they don't have information about efficacy of things like ultrasonic waves, UV, um, and other things. Um, there are some devices that will manufacture a hydro. Uh, chlorous acid, and some people are supporting those, especially if they're having trouble getting an adequate supply of other things. Um, we have not endorsed those products um, because we think that they off-gas some chlorine, which is also an asthmogen, but um, some of the other organizations, such as Turi, have supported those. Um, so I would say just you know keep looking at the CDC guidance. Uh, for updates on any of these uh, disinfection methods. Next slide. 
Um, just want to reiterate that CDC says it's really important to clean visibly dir dirty surfaces um, and then disinfect. It's a two-step process. I know it's hard. People are going to be doing a lot of cleaning, uh, but you want to make sure that all that work is not gone uh, to not. And that is the best practice for preventing COVID-19 and other viral respiratory illnesses. Um, so if you're going to be disinfecting, most important to be focusing on the high touch surfaces um, in common areas, things like tables and chairs. I was just talking to a school about their school buses, doorknobs, um, and other types of things. So especially where multiple people are going to be um, in contact with the same uh, item. Next slide. Uh, I just wanted to um, say one word and end about talking about green cleaning, certified green cleaners. We have long been an advocate for third party certified green cleaners because they look at cleaning products um, against multiple attributes, uh, including health things like cancer and reproductive toxins and endocrine disruption, et cetera. And then they also look at environmental impacts as well. So if you're going to be looking at uh, cleaning products or specifying cleaning products for your contracts, um, look for products that have one of these certifications, Green Seal, Safer Choice, um, Eco logo or cradle to cradle. If you want more guidance on green cleaners and safer disinfectants, you can find it on our website um, at the link that is presented below. Next slide. Thank you very much for, for tuning in. I'm sure you're gonna have a lot of questions, put them in the question box, and I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Julia. Thank you, Alicia. This is Julia. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, I have mouse control. Yay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Julia Singer. I'm a com communication specialist and I work for the Hazardous Waste Management Program. And I'm taking a little bit, uh, I'm taking us on a different journey right now, which is um, how did we continue our residential outreach projects? the topic being safer cleaning at home, how did we do that during this pandemic? Let me see if I can make it go. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh, I'll go back. So the Hazardous Waste Management Program is located in King County, Washington, and you might have heard of our largest city, Seattle, or you might have heard of some of our other businesses that are located here, such as Starbucks or Microsoft. That's the county that we're in. We um, have over 2 million people and 60,000 small businesses, and the mission of the Hazardous Waste Management Program is to protect the health and the environment, human health and the environment in our county from the risks of creating, using, storing, or getting rid of hazardous materials. Um, we're a very diverse county with over 170 languages spoken. One thing that's important for me to be able to answer the question of how did we do outreach during this pandemic is to note that our program some years ago decided to embed racial equity in all of our work. And our goal is that a person's race is not a determinant of whether or not they're exposed to hazardous materials in their home or in their business. So we're, we, are, we do a lot of different outreach, and today I'm going to be talking about our residential outreach um, with a focus on safer cleaning. And what we found as we tried to do outreach and lead with equity is that we really needed to partner with community-based organizations. We found that our community partners provide a connection with their communities. They provide language skills, knowledge, and outreach about those communities where we, the Hazways Program, can provide grant or contract funding. We provide topical support and we, we look at where our topics overlap with what topics are of interest to the community. We provide technical support and project management. And um, the way we work equitably is we attempt to share power and co-create. And that's definitely been a journey. I don't want to pretend it hasn't been. We, we're, we have learned how 
to share power and co-create. And when we're co-creating, I'm talking about even something as simple as an agenda, but also how are we gonna do outreach best for that community? What materials best serve that community? What kind of evaluation methods and how we're gonna do reporting. So today I wanna to talk about two of our community partners and the projects that we're doing with them. One of our community partners right now is CMR Community Health Center. They serve primarily the Hispanic community in our region. We're working with them. We're also working with um, Mother Africa and they serve primarily immigrants and refugees from Africa. Our, our usual outreach method with community is very much in person and it's often in home. So we're giving workshops, we're um, handing out products for people to touch, we're demonstrating safer cleaning methods, and we're, we are sometimes literally in people's homes. Um, and um, as I already mentioned, the projects I'm talking about today, were our focus was safer cleaning is. Um, our key message was that um, people, and we are talking about residents, can buy safer cleaners. So we're teaching label reading, signal words, and we are encouraging people to avoid danger poison if they can, and then to look for um, logos, eco logos. And what I've mostly noticed on the shelves is EPA safer choice, really not very much cradle to cradle. So we're teaching people about this. We're also teaching uh, folks that they can make their own safer cleaners using baking soda, vinegar, and a dish soap. And then this thing happened. So as this happened, and here in Washington State, um, our staff were told that we were going to be teleworking starting the first week of March, and yet we had these ongoing projects with community partners. And I will say it was really um, it was really a head scratcher that we really had to pause and say, even amongst ourselves as Hasway staff, now what? Um, we definitely had to take a look at our key messages because we are teaching something called safer cleaning, and yet, you know, how do we uh, reconcile that with this incredible uh, need to disinfect because of COVID? Um, how are we supposed to plan if we can't meet anymore in person? And we, and we are working with a variety of languages being spoken. Uh, it was like, how are we going to do this? And then our whole goal with these two community partners in particular was in-home visits teaching safer cleaning in a hands-on way, person to person, eyeball to eyeball. How are we supposed to do that? So it was really like, now what? What are we gonna do? Um, and the very first thing we had to do is kind of get together and decide how does our safer cleaning message uh, reconcile with a need for um, disinfectant? And um, Alicia and Nancy already covered this. In fact, I'm sure we used some information from Nancy and Alicia to try to get our minds around what we were going to say. But what we realized is you can still do safer cleaning with the methods that we talked about. And then you, we were going to suggest people put on PPE and have proper ventilation, and then you disinfect. Um, we do refer people to the in list. Um, I'm even now I'm realizing that I, there's a hole in my own knowledge in terms of safer disinfectant that that folks can find in the grocery store. I'm going to guess maybe there aren't any. I'm going to be trying to figure that out. But at least in this document, what we're referring people to is the inlet. You need you need to have a EPA registered disinfectant. So once we had our key message clear, then we went back to planning like, okay, well now what are we gonna do? Um, and our partners most often preferred to meet audio only. We didn't even have, I know people are sick of Zoom or Skype or whatever, but we were often in meetings with partners you know, just uh, hunched over a telephone, which was pretty interesting. The most important thing we had to ask them is, can we continue? We, we want to share this information with our with your communities, but how are our communities, how are we going to do that? And then we had to take into account people are terrified, struggling, sick, afraid with COVID. How are we going to talk about cleaning with COVID running rampant? And so I, we, this wasn't a linear or simple conversation. It was really all over the place. 
Um, and as we planned with our community partners, we really had to recognize and deal with equity issues. When COVID information first came out, it was only in English, and our partners needed Spanish, Arabic, French, Somali, and other languages spoken in Africa. Our partners, our partner staff, most were working at home and they may or may not have had good internet. Um, partner staff may or may not have had space to dedicate to a home office. They may have very much have been sitting in their kitchen with their children and spouses all around them. In, in my work uh, associations, um, so some people became ill with COVID and could be tested and some could not be tested. And that seemed like an equity issue. It was certainly confusing in the early days about how and you know testing was limited, but it also seemed potentially equity, knowing how to work the system and having insurance. Um, the other thing that was big is that we had to expand our key, our key message of safer cleaning to include COVID information because it just didn't make sense to try to talk to community members about our special topic of safer cleaning when they were struggling with what it had to deal with COVID. So we, we expanded beyond our scope, which is sometimes uncomfortable for government agencies. Um, so we were asked our partners this question, how are we gonna provide service or can we? And both partners independently decided to go ahead and you know, from the Hasway stat, we had uh, different project managers working with those communities. So it was kind of interesting that we had a parallel uh, a agreement or not agreement, but an approach. Um, we decided to turn an in-home visit into a virtual visit. And the way both folks uh, decided to approach that is the, the, the in-home visit, which might have had a very short phone call and then, a, then actual going into people's home, it became several touch points. The initial phone call was more than just recruitment. It became um, a time when we gathered demographic information and we also did our pre-visit survey and that was audio only. Um, we, as part of our in-home visit, we would take in a safer cleaning kit with baking soda, vinegar, an EPA safer choice, dish soap, sponge, microfiber cloth, and flyers translated because we're, let's not forget, we're working in Spanish, Arabic, and French. Um, so we had to, uh, our uh, partners agreed that they would deliver these kits to people's doors. They're not going inside, they're dropping them off. So they're having to arrange to do that. And then immediately following, um, they were gonna perform or provide a virtual visit on a video platform. Each, each uh, partner approached this um, virtual visit in a slightly different way. And that's just a, um, to note that that's equitable, um, that to, it, once you don't just make a decision and then tell everybody what to do, it's like each partner is saying, this is what works for us. CIMAR, the, that serves the Hispanic community, they are now, they started a couple of weeks ago, they are doing virtual visits, in-home visits. Um, they decided to use a platform of WhatsApp because their community was familiar with it. And also because WhatsApp does allow kind of a live demonstration, our in-home visits were are very, uh, or were, and I guess still are, very focused on having participants read the labels of their own cleaning products because that really is an aha moment when you tell people, you know, some cleaning products can hurt you, but then if they go get their own products and uh, read the labels and realize, oh, you mean these cleaning products that I am using can hurt me, wow. So WhatsApp allowed for more of a live, um, demonstration and participants themselves are doing that. So they're reading their own labels and they are also practicing cleaning with baking soda. Um, in, in the CMAR case, the staff is actually working from their office, but they're in individual offices and they're um, socially distanced. The participants are on their phone. So all of this has to make sense on a phone screen. Mother Africa, um, they're beginning their virtual, vi the actual visits, well, so virtual visits later in June, um, they have decided to use Zoom um, because th their approach is more of a presentation style. They want to be able to show a PowerPoint. And we are in deep in discussion as to how we're actually going to manage to do a demonstration. You, you can imagine that if you're a presenter and you're tethered to your laptop, you cannot pick up your laptop and walk into the kitchen and do a baking soda demo. The participants can, but some people may very well feel shy about having their kitchen all of a sudden on display, even if 
Um, it's just on a display to one other person that's in their community. Also, our Mother Africa staff are working from their homes. Um, we all had to learn and we are still learning. Uh, how do you be respectful um, and listen? Some people do not want to be seen on video, whether it's a, for a personal reason or a cultural reason. So you may really only have audio. How, how do you do that? Um, and just really simple things that seem simple, but really had to be overcome. We have, you know, hundreds of safer cleaning kits in our offices in Seattle, which are locked up. Um, how do we get those kits out to the, our community partners and how do they get them to the participants that definitely had to be figured out? Our vehicles aren't running because the batteries are dead. Um, simple yet things that had to be thought through. All of us had to become better at video conferencing and we have a variety of online survey tools we're using. Everybody had to become more familiar. Um, the good news from, from our point of view is that virtual visits are working. They appear to be working. Um, CMR is already out there doing their visits and part of that uh, in-home visit, now virtual visit, is that we're asking participants to take a pledge to use safer cleaners um, because that's a behavior change uh, reinforcer. And, and our first several weeks of information from our CMAR partners are showing that people are willing to take this pledge to use safer cleaners, which is very exciting. And uh, to report on Mother Africa, um, they've done 60 of our pre-visit phone calls and what the data from those phone calls is showing is that um, people are interested in the topics that we want to, would like to teach about and they don't already know about them, which is great. They don't already have all the answers. So we feel that our Mother Africa project's moving in the right direction. So virtual visits work. That's thrilling news. So uh, to go circle back to my question is how does Has Waste do outreach during a pandemic? It really um, is based on uh, decisions that were made years ago. A as an institution, we committed to leading with racial equity as an antidote to institutionalized racism. Um, because of that commitment, we've, we've figured out ways to build and nurture relationships over time with community partners. And, and by that, I really do mean build personal relationships with the folks that we're working with. Um, we've learned to modify our leading with equity to include sharing power and co-creating. And that is kind of a messy and sloppy process, I, I just want to say, and it's not even clear what that means often, but when you get into it, you, you learn. We want to share power and we want to co-create all these methods and ways of doing outreach. Being familiar with that somewhat messy but co-creative space allowed us when the pandemic appeared to be able to sit in a space of not knowing what to do or how to move forward and just allow ourselves and our partners the um, the space to be creative and to try and to think and figure out and to not know and to figure out a way forward which is what we're doing and the other thing I want to add here right now is I would be remiss in not mentioning that we are working with um, our partners, the staff, partner staff, our people of color, and our communities that we're trying to outreach to our people of color. And not only are we all dealing with a pandemic, but now the spotlight of social media is shining brightly on the on racism, racist acts, violence. Uh, per perpetuated particularly against black people and communities of color. So yet again, we're going to be in a situation with our partners and we, we started the conversation this week. What do you think? How can we, should we be teaching about safer cleaning in the middle of this incredible social unrest, um, people being justifiably extremely angry, um, how does that how does that affect the communities that we're trying to serve? It's different for a Hispanic community versus the African community, Black people, Muslims. We're, so here we are again doing the exact same thing, which is to say co-creating and sharing power with our partners, and that's how we're going to figure it out. I don't have that answer. It's a question. It's an open question. We're figuring it out. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. I, I just I want to express gratitude to our partner staff at Mother Africa and CMAR for working and teaching us here at Has Waste. Thank you very much.
Thank you, and thanks to all of our presenters. This is Andy Bray. Um, we are going to move into the Q&A section now. And we've had a number of great questions come in. So let me just work my way through the list here. Um, thanks again to our presenters. Um, a lot of great content. It's generated a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion here. Uh, question in the order that they came in and um, just heard from a vendor that Clorox has suspended the production of hydrogen peroxide wipes. Was anyone else, has anyone else heard of that? Heard that? Uh, this is Alicia. I have not heard of that, but there are a lot of supply chain issues, um, uh, you know, out there. And so, you know, we may need to broaden our scope. If they're looking for wipes, there are Purell wipes, um, for example, and there's Oxivir wipes. So if people really need wipes, there are some others. But remember about the cost of wipes. So I would encourage people to use wipes selectively <laughs> um, because they're gonna end up being costly and adding to their trash. Thank you. Um, a question about um, kind of a, along similar lines about supply. Um, that we're all struggling to get many of the disinfectant products on the EPA list. Will we be sharing resources to be able to purchase from? So any any um, supply outlets or suppliers that folks are aware of that people might not be accessing. Hi, this is. Alicia again. Um, this is something that we've been monitoring. I would say start if you're a government agency or nonprofit, you can use a state contract. They may get some preferential treatment. So you could look at some of those um, contracts. So we're trying to figure out how to keep on monitoring and we'll we'll try to get back with more information if, as we know of others. Um, ways to where the, these products are available. As I said, we may need to expand our um, purview of what's acceptable um, and develop a hierarchy if some of the safest ones are not available. Others want to add anything to that? No, a uh, question about product identification. Will there always be an EPA registration number on the product packaging for registered products? Right now it's required by yeah. law, so yes. Yeah. Okay. And one thing, I, Kevin, I would like to mention, this is Nancy, that is if you cannot find the one for the coronavirus for COVID-19, as long as there's another EPA registered disinfectant that has coronaviruses listed, you can also use that one because that has that can kind of address some of the supply chain issues. It's listed on the EPA uh, and CDC website. Thanks, Nancy. Um, this question I think is for Alicia. Uh, what was the product that was recommended for electronics? It's alcohol. Alcohol, uh, yeah. Alcohol, alcohol wipes the, uh, um, also, the uh, the Purell uh, wipes can be available. You know, there's also, as Nancy was talking about, there's different strategies. I think people may need to think outside the box. So it could be that I've heard of covers being put on, um, and then those are, could be easily washed. So you may think, you know, of that. What you want to do is, when you look at that EPA registration label, look at anything that talks about um whether it's compatible with the type of material that your electronics so if they're metal or they're plastic um the epa registration label should let you know whether it is specifically approved for electronics and um whether there's any corrosiveness issues i think you want to avoid obviously spraying right onto that but you could also take another approved disinfectant if you can't find the wipes you can put it on a regular wipe or even a paper towel as long as it gets you know fully saturated or just the 70 percent alcohol and you can use that just as well great 
Uh, Alicia, another question for you about, um, you mentioned wiping off disinfectant that was sprayed on, or is it about, oh, let me try to rephrase this. I'm not quite clear on the question myself. Is the efficacy of wiping that you mentioned about wiping off disinfectant that was sprayed on, or is it about the use of wipes instead of spray or disinfectants? Any info on efficacy of wipes versus spray? Um, not, it was more the second that we hear some people that are just saying, oh, we just want to use these foggers, for example, or some spray. And I would just caution that the, the, the labels basically say you need to not only pre-clean, you need to put it on the surface, let it stay on the surface, but often you need to wipe it off. Um, and so the wiping can be part of the efficacy. The wiping can also be part of the instructions because some of the chemicals are corrosive. So you don't want people touching them afterwards or they could corrode the material um, if you're spraying it every single day. So, um, you know, I would say that there is, the, what I was also referring to is just some studies that I've been reading about that showed that the more you actually physically wipe something, that process also clean stuff off. It's the same reason we've had to relook at the issue of hand soaps. We have for a long time said, use the foaming hand soaps, they save water. But some of the studies now are coming out saying, well, they rinse off so fast that people aren't doing the full two minutes, that it's actually better to use the liquids because then you really are kind of forced to have to get the friction on your hands and for a longer period of time. And when they've tested people's hands, they um, have fewer uh, germs, including COVID on them. So I would say the, you know, the old elbow grease is going to be your friend in terms of helping to remove um, dirt and germs. And the germs often are sticking to the dirt. Thanks, Alicia. And kind of along the same lines, but how about um, when you're using electrostatic sprayers? Same thing, you still got to lean in with the elbow? Yeah, always. I mean, some of those electrostatic products will just generate um, a, a, a solution. So then you're just using it the same way, but always go to the EPA registration label. We found very few actual devices on the EPA end list or even have an EPA registration number at all. So I would very much caution, you know, about those if they're not specifically approved by the um, EPA on the end list. Well, and again, on this in the same thread, you know, have any of you um, looked into stabilized aqueous ozone, like in the Terrasono SAO dispenser? Um, not specifically as a surface disinfectant. If it's on the end list, then it can be used. If it's not, then you wouldn't use it. Alrighty. Um, I think this is more comment than a question, but um, from uh, important to provide info on EPA's registration of pesticide devices. Any of those devices that Alicia you mentioned may use confusing language about EPA approved, but they do not go through the same efficacy and safety review as the pesticide chemicals. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, we looked at devices and that's the exact problem that we ran into, that they didn't have the full pledge same um, EPA registration. So some of the things like, you know, things that generate hypochlorous acid. Now I have seen that there are a couple of these devices that are approved on the end list. So I would assume if, it's on the end list again it's it's okay but you need to look very carefully because they activate chemicals and the question is how long does that chemical remain active products that are you know pre-packaged often last for a year um, devices that are generating an aqueous solution you know um, may not last as long so again whatever the product or devices if you find it on the end list then go and grab that epa registration label and read it top to bottom to make sure you know everything about how it works thanks 
Um, question for um, how would you recommend employees deal with employees who want to bring in their own disinfectant products, especially to clean high touch surfaces and office electronics? Um, this is it's up to the employer to provide that in the workplace. Employees should not be bringing in their own products. And I agree with that. I mean, for that exact reason, Nancy showed the, the incompatibility of different chemicals. You got to be super careful about that. And so the employer should be using that. So you can, you know, um, they, they can generate it at a dilution station, which is more cost effective, or they can just provide uh, the bottles. I have seen some places that does allow people to bring it in, but only very specific products. Um, but it's really much better for us, you know, a single system. And, you know, there are a number of organizations that are going through and setting up um, and doing green cleaning, you know, uh, protocols and policies. And more and more, I think they're looking at, you know, let's have a single you know, process so everybody can get trained the same way. So if a custodial person goes from one building to the next, they're not having to, you know, deal with different chemicals, different dilution stations and different processes. So as much as possible, I would encourage, you know, not allowing products to come in and, and having the employer set up a single um, system and then train um, around that. Great advice. Uh, could someone comment on disinfectin, disin, disinfection with hydrogen peroxide versus accelerated or advanced hydrogen peroxide, uh, you know, in terms of efficacy and safety? Okay, I guess I can take that on. I'll let so you do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were talking about this yesterday, the same question. So yeah, these questions keep coming up. So hydrogen peroxide that you buy in, say, the drugstore um, is very unstable, and it's not listed by either CDC or EPA as an effective thing to use against uh, coronavirus, which is different than just 70% alcohol, by the way, that is uh, approved um, as a product that's effective. Accelerated hydrogen peroxide is a proprietary combination of hydrogen peroxide with non-pesticidal um, chemicals that stabilize it so that it can stay in solution um, long enough to be able to have efficacy against a wide array of of um, viruses, some of them have one-minute dwell time um, against, you know, both, you know, viruses as well as uh, bacteria, and some of them, Oxivir TB, for example, is even effective against um, TB, which is a relatively difficult um, organism to kill compared to say, coronavirus. Um, so it's just a proprietary ingredient that is found. You'll see it says AHP, and it's by a company named Virox, which is out of Canada, and they have allowed companies like Diversity to put it into their Alpha HP and Oxivir um, products. Other companies like Clorox, for example, also have stabilized hydrogen peroxide products that have very, very um, strong efficacy. And then the other companies are coming onto the market now. Some hydrogen peroxide products you really need this is why you need to look at the SDS as well as the label. Some of them have other chemicals mixed in with them, like quats, for example. I've seen that quats, you know, listed not as an active ingredient but as a surfactant, but the product seems to be acting more like a quat. So um, important to look at all those things. Look at the EPA registration label and the product safety sheet to see what they say about the health effects and other ingredients that might be in the product. Thanks. Question about whether healthcare is transitioning away from quats and bleach. Definitely away from bleach because it's not effective. Um, a lot of hospitals don't use bleach anymore. They do use quats, especially the neutral quats, but more and more they're transitioning to the hydrogen peroxide because of the asthma concerns. Yeah, the same with schools and also daycare providers are switching. It, uh, it also depends on, you have to make sure you follow the health code for some of those um, workplaces, but it, it is um, shifting. 
Yeah, when we did the pilot project with child care centers in, in San Francisco, we really had to actively engage um, the licensing organizations because they're used to just testing the bleach solution, even though the laws typically will say use bleach or another EPA approved um, disinfectant, um, they, they don't have the test strips for it. So it does take some engagement of those um, organizations to make sure that they understand um, how to oversee the proper use of alternative safer disinfectants. Another really practical question. Um, technical support staffs that are receiving employee laptops that have been shift, shipped from staff's houses, um, you know, they take the laptops in, but they want to disinfect them before the technical staff work on them. Um, how do they best go about disinfecting the electrical equipment? I would say that's the same, you know, they either use a wipe or they use a, they use an EPA list and disinfectant, you know, they don't want to spray it because it could get into the equipment, but I would say some kind of a wipe or a, like a paper towel or a microfiber um, cloth that's then, you know, they try to uh, wash it down as much as they can without getting water into the you know, into the components and then again, just try to um, clean it off with a disinfectant. Nancy, I don't and know if you have any different. No, I, I agree with that. That's what I would do too. Any advice for soft surfaces like seating? There, uh, there are some products that are specifically approved for that application. Um, uh, CDC website is saying soap and water. Um, there are, I think there was some questions about steaming furniture, but there's a lot about just washing in your lawn, if you can throw it in the laundry, um, if it's a home-based use. Um, but like soft yeah. cushion chairs, we've worked with fire departments over the years to get them to actually replace out their, you know, couches and, and with uh, non-porous. So, yeah, and they may be able to spray something like alcohol on it um, as well, or you know something that's a an approved disinfectant spray on. But they should look to make sure it's approved for that application. Yeah, and it'll say it too. Uh, a comment on the end list that it seems hard to use, and then a specific question about didecal dimethyl ammonium chloride. A quad, so it's an asthmogen. Any of those ammonium chloride ones are asthmogens, so they should avoid it if they can and use one of the safer ones with the hydrogen peroxide um, or citric or acid. Yeah, alcohol based. I mean, yeah, I'd be interested in, I think if they have specific feedback for EPA about how the product, the list is difficult to use, they should email into, there's an, e there's an, um, an email that they can use. I have specifically already done that myself, um, pointing out that the, the EPA registration name, like the oxytene disinfectant um, is never called that in the marketplace. And so many people have said, oh, we can't use Oxivir, we can't use the, the Alpha HP anymore. And I'm like, yeah, you can. So it, this extra step of making people go to the go through the EPA registration number, I think is hard for some people. And I think that they should do a better job at listing the names that are commonly you know, um, on the marketplace for those products. And I will say that they are responsive because in the first few weeks of the pandemic, we started looking at the ingredients inside the products because EPA didn't even have that listed. They just had the EPA registration number and the name of the product. And so we were like, kind of like, how are we going to give people guidance if we don't even know what the active ingredients are in all these products? So they will, they will respond if you give comments. You know, I think that they should link to the um, to the EPA leg registration label. So I thought they originally had done that, and um, it seems like that would be a, a way to save, you know, um, 
save people time and make sure that there's not a, a mistake there. You know, I was just looking when we were originally talking, I heard you all talking about, you know, are there any products in the, in the supermarket that we can recommend? And so I went on and I think a lot of those products have citric acid in there and there are some products, Lysol, um, there's a bathroom cleaner and there's a, um, a Comet a cleaner. Um, there's a there's a method cleaner and it's called Freak. I know it's not called Freak in the marketplace, um, but so they should just list it. Fine, you want to say what it's originally listed as, but put what it's called on the shelf so that people can easily find that product. Thanks, great feedback. Um, question about office reopening plans. Um, there's been a lot of discussions about creating mudrooms where people enter into a, a space before they enter into the main office area. What kind of protocols should they be should be observed by staff entering, um, passing through that space in this post-COVID environment? Which I wish we were post-COVID, frankly, but so you mean so certain protocols involving um, the social distancing as well as having um, hand sanitizers or having uh, people go right to wash their hands when they first come in, having walk-off mats at the entrance of the doors. Um, is that, I, I don't know if that's what they're asking about, but there yeah, is uh, there is guidance for offices. So you can go to the, to the uh, CDC's website. It is a big focus, so you'll be able to find them there. Thanks, Nancy. Really, really specific question. Um, if, if I think it's Shirley Schiff, you can rename the um, the wipes, the the Sani and light. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, rename the wipes to consider during the, you know, in this time, safer wipes. You know, why don't they send me an, an email because there were a number of them, but there there is the hydrogen peroxide wipes, which are from Oxivir, Oxivir TB wipes. There, um, there have been Clorox hydrogen peroxide disinfecting wipes. They're sometimes called Clorox Healthcare hydrogen peroxide wipes, although somebody on this, I would love to get information that whoever put that in about how Clorox is phasing them out, this would be a bad time to do that. Um, there also are Purell wipes. Um, now, if people want to have cleaning wipes, because again, cleaners do, um, you know, help to deactivate. There are, you know, there are some on the safer choice list, like Clorox Green Works wipes. Um, but again, you can, you know, just use a microfiber cloth and spray it and then, or even a paper towel, as long as you make sure that the surface is fully saturated, um, you can, you know, make your own wipes using an endless disinfectant. Nancy, I don't know if you want to add anything No, I agree. To that. Yeah. I agree with you on that one. A uh, question on microfiber cloths: um, Why they're why why they're recommended as a good cleaning material? Um, you know, this person's been traditionally using cotton or cotton terry. So, there's. Can you hear me? Yeah. So the microfiber can um, is more effective at capturing the microbes. There was a study done out of the University of California, the Davis Medical Center. And they compared cotton loop mops with microfiber mops, and they found that the cotton mops only reduced the bacteria on the floors by 30%, and the other mops, um, the microfiber did it by 90, 99%. So that's one reason. Other reasons is you can do color coding. So you could have your red microfibers for the bathrooms and your blue for the kitchen, so you can really keep cross-contamination from happening. Um, and also uh, from water, from the use of water, uh, they're also more effective um, for that. So, and they're lighter, like if you have a worker, if you're interested in a worker um, load of, you know, using a microfiber mop versus a cotton one, the load of having to squeeze and, and clean those, use those is, is a lot less. So I can add two things to that. Um... One is that they were developed for use in hospitals and 
what happens is they did the hospitals didn't want to have a situation where they're cleaning one room where there's a you know a disease going on and then they go to the next room and they just take the mop and the water and they take it into the next room and then they essentially are spreading the germs from place to place one of the benefits of microfiber is you can do one room and then peel it off and put it into the laundry and then go to the next room and you're never putting a dirty mop back into the water. Um, you know, there we have witnessed a lot of custodial staff doing cleaning and they will often with a cotton mop, put the mop in the soapy water, you know, clean the floor then put it back into the same water. And so you're essentially putting a lot of the dirt and germs back in there and, and not often cleaning it until it gets really dirty. The other thing that I um, have read some studies on is quats and they, there's a thing called quat binding. Quats tend to bind to cotton mops and reduce their efficacy. So if you are using quats, which you don't you know, recommend, um, that's specifically an issue and I agree with you Nancy about the you know the ergonomics of it you know it's just the the cotton mops are really heavy they hurt people's back and with more and more cleaning you know we need to be taking that into consideration as well thanks a uh, question about whether or not steam has been evaluated uh, as effective on the novel coronavirus I didn't hear you. What did you say? Uh, whether or not steam has been evaluated as an in, as an effective disinfectant for the novel coronavirus. What is? I don't know what steam. I don't is. know what I don't know what you're saying, Kevin. Sorry, steam. Ah, uh, steam. Sorry. I, I guess I don't know what that is. Steam. Hot water. Steam. Yeah. Oh, yeah, steam. steam. Sorry, steam. Um. Let's see, I did look into some of the STEAM questions. Uh, I, I think it is, I'd have to, I'll have to get back to that one, at least unless you know. I did look up some of the STEAM questions. I don't think CDC, they do have it on their website. I don't think it's a confirm though. Um, I haven't looked at it specifically for coronavirus, but we did look into it for the San Francisco report, and there were a lot of concerns, occupational concerns with burning, obviously using a lot of water, mold concerns as well. Where When we um, interviewed companies uh, that are janitorial supply companies, they typically said that there's very you know limited applications where they would typically recommend it, where there's a very greasy environment or maybe outdoors, but um, typically not as a day-to-day -day, um, disinfecting method. Okay. Well, here's a really good question, whether or not um, wipes, you know, for businesses, are wipes trash or are they hazardous waste, you know, particularly in states like California and Washington, where there's more stringent regulations than the, than the federal regs on, on wipes? <laughs> That I'm not sure, but I think it's regular trash at this point. Unless you're in a healthcare setting, I think it might be different. If you're treat, if you're in a location where there is a COVID-19 case, um, I don't know if anyone else knows the answer to that one. I think it's a great question. I think we again we should get back on yeah. that one. Um, I think the chemicals themselves are, you know, would be considered more of like a universal waste not enough to be a hazardous waste but I don't know the question of you know the answer to the question about okay these things might have you know uh, contamination with the coronavirus in it um, what I do know is that there is a very strong plea out there do not flush the wipes down the toilet um, there is a lot of problems that have been reported that of increased number of wipes going to sewage system and it's clogging up the sewage system and it could get yeah. COVID and the chemicals into the water supply. So that would be like, just please don't put the wipes down the drain or in the toilet. 
we are just going to have time for maybe one or two more questions and uh, apologize in advance to anyone whose question we don't get to. We will for sure follow up following the webinar, but we want to leave just a little bit of time for resource sharing at the end here. And we're starting to quickly come up on time, actually. Um, so last question, I guess. Um, What is your recommendation for cleaning high school classrooms during the day when students aren't, when students are changing classrooms multiple times? What products or processes are best? Well, I would recommend looking at the Washington Department of Health's um, guidance documents. They have really excellent resources. Um, so I would refer people to there for my state. <laughs> Um, I guess I would generally agree. I mean, this is something that we're looking into more. CDC does have guidance. What I'm concerned about is that they give the kids the wipes. Um, and I just don't think that the children should be no. um, handling these materials. A lot of them do say to use PPE. A lot of them say to be using these products. I, I guess I would recommend if the students or anyone is going to do something that they just use soap and water on the desk. Great, thanks so much for all of the all the great questions and much appreciate the, the panelists' responses. We will follow up uh, following the webinar and, and get back with folks whose questions didn't get answered and apologize for that. Um, we had planned to spend time at the end here, um, transitioning from a webinar to a resource sharing session. Um, let me, uh, but before we go there, Saski, let me just turn things back over to you for, for to conclude the formal webinar. I just uh, wanted to take again last minute. Thank everybody for uh, your attention. Really appreciated your attendance. And again, thank you to Nancy, Alicia, and Julia for all of um, the information that you shared. Yeah, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Saski, Kevin. Yes, we're happy to answer more questions if you have questions that did not get answered. Thank, thank you for having me. This is Julia. I learned a lot also. Thank you. Thanks to all for being on. And with that, we'll conclude our formal webinar and invite people to stick around for some resource sharing. Great. And <clears throat> This is Kevin Masterson, and I'm on the IC2 training work group, and we just wanted to tack on uh, about 15 minutes maybe to allow people to share resources because there's been so much focus on this topic recently. We know many governments, nonprofits, and businesses have generated a lot of resources and have been working on developing new resources, and we thought it would be beneficial to hear from some of you or have you post some of those links to those resources. Um, on the chat box or the question box. Um, and specifically, we're looking for any information that you have on technical assistance and education resources, procurement guidelines or criteria and communication tools and strategies. All of those I think would be beneficial for people to, to hear about. I think um, Andy's gonna be able to compile some of those links and uh, hopefully share them along with the presentations that you heard today. Um, so if we could start maybe by posting some new ones that we just learned about recently, um, a blog posting and newsletter uh, article that uh, Saskia and the Department of Ecology came up with. I don't know if Andy, you can post that. And the city of San Francisco uh, just came up with a um, a COVID a cleaning for COVID webpage with a fact sheet and databases where you can find approved products, uh, which will be extremely beneficial for a lot of folks across the country. Um, and I don't know, Saskia or the folks from San Francisco, if you want to say anything about those resources. I can speak briefly about um, the two that were shared. So basically, um, I was the sharer, but it was our um, communication uh, program that uh, wrote these. And so one of them was a 
blog article, which was to, um, you know, a broader audience. So basically um, public as well as, um, you know, people in workplaces. And so that was shared. And this was basically after the UW um, fact sheet was developed. And so it took um, a lot of the content from there and put it into a blog, as well as there was a um, article that was posted through uh, Shop Talk, which is for um, it's a newsletter for uh, dangerous waste as well as pollution prevention. And so that was more for an occupational audience. I just posted the uh, fa the fact sheet you mentioned, um, Saskia. That's in Spanish and English. I don't know if it worked though. It looks kind of like it jumped together. So right. And also, yeah. sorry. What? What? what sorry. I just wanted to note that uh, we will be um, saving and copying and pasting these resources. Right. Is there anybody on the line still from the city of San Francisco, Jen or Chris Geiger, or anybody that wants to talk about their new COVID cleaning webpage? That's okay if they're not, but I think uh, people would find that uh, very informative and interesting, a lot of great information in there. Thanks for putting that up on the screen, Andy. Or Saskia and Andy. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, Liz Harriman from Massachusetts Toxic Use Reduction Institute. Did you want to talk about what you all are developing? Andy, do you need to, or can you unmute? <laughs> yes, apologies. I'm uh, feverishly scrolling through our quite lengthy attendee Sorry. list trying to no no worries uh Liz, you should unmute it now i am unmuted hi um yeah so so we're just getting back into our labs you know hopefully this next week and uh and so we have quite a few plans for in terms of disinfection we've been doing the cleaning side for a long time um a couple of things i was going to add to to remarks already made uh, the question about um, soft surfaces and textiles, uh, we heard from EPA recently that they're going to be doing some research on that. And I don't have a link off the top of my head, but uh, but hopefully that will help a bit in that space um, because the other alternative that everyone's looking at are em embedding antimicrobials, which we don't think is a very good long-term plan. Um, you also mentioned the uh, some of the devices. so. Uh, we have, and you mentioned that Turi had been, you know, sort of um, talking about one of those, um, the ones that generate hypochlorous acid. So we have used like the force of nature and, and one other piece of equipment quite a bit. Um, we did do a pretty uh, detailed investigation of, of the NADCC tablets, which also generate hypochlorous acid versus bleach. And we found that the exposure, the airborne exposure to chlorine was much, much lower um, with the NADCC tablet. So we haven't done that test with the force of nature hypochlorous acid equipment, but we have done it with the NADCC tablet. So we were certainly concerned about that um, from the get-go, but, uh, but it appears that the exposure is far lower from those products. Um, and we hope to do some more testing on that. Um, so how's that for a, a quick update? I know we don't have much time. Yeah, thanks very much, Liz. Will this be, else. will Terry be publishing the results? I, this is Alicia, I'm really interested in seeing that because we're getting so many questions about that. Both the, and it, this, the tablets and the, uh, uh, your assessment of the tablets like Brutab and the devices. Yes, we will. We, we uh, almost have the, the uh, study with the brew tabs um, ready to publish. Um, so hopefully very soon. And we're, we're certainly Great. willing to share data with you as well. Is that Alicia? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so we can share the data as well. Great, uh, are there others on the line who want to be unmuted who could talk about what they may be 
in the midst of producing or um, have already developed that others would, would benefit from. Kevin, can I ask that folks use their the raise chat, your hand? Uh, raise the hand. Yeah. Yeah, and then I'll I'll get the prompt to unmute them. That'd be great. All right, great. Well, Andy, is there a place where after the webinar is over that they can, um, that folks can post resources that they might have available to share? Or is it best just to email you or? Yeah, it's probably best comments? just to email me, Kevin, and I'll compile what's been shared through the, the questions in chat and whatever I receive after the webinar. And we will post that on the IC2 site along with the recorded webinar session. Sounds great. I saw Carol Westinghouse had her hand up, so I've unmuted her. Great. Did you un unmute me or, or Carol? I'm working with Carol. Is Carol on the line as well? It may just be that you have a shared mm -hmm. uh, webinar login, but. Um, yeah, we probably do. I know she was on the line because we we're emailing back and forth. This is Lynn Rose. Carol and I are working under a t some TURI funding to update our, um, we did a guide on infection control uh, for schools called Cleaning for Healthier Schools, and uh, an infection control guide. So this year, uh, because it was 10 years old and devices have changed and products have changed and now we have COVID-19, um, we, we did, a, because it's a really kind of small pot of money in a very short turnaround time, we're looking at doing more hands-on, when I say hands-on, more kind of operational tools uh, for schools to use, you know, kind of more pull-out, fact sheets, infographics, um, and we're updating all our information on devices and products. Um, so I can, I can give an outline of the guide. I can send that in with more details. So uh, we're working closely with Turi and, and running things by the lab. Uh, in order to make sure we're on top of things. This, this is Liz. Thanks, Lynn, for, for pointing that out. I'm glad you were on the line to mention it. And, and yeah, we, yeah. Get a lot of, we get a lot of work out of you for a small amount of money. <laughs> you too, you always do. What's, what's great, what I want to say is I work in operations, so I always work in facility departments and schools, and this is um, to have this level of technical information to be able to to put into work practices and because what I'm finding, you know, getting calls from the Facilities Managers Association and, you know, everybody is like overwhelmed with everybody using all kinds of disinfectants and spending enormous amount of money to get their schools disinfected by companies that are really uh, capitalizing on people's fear. So it's great to, uh, to be able to have this information to bring back that's documented um, to say why you don't, after seven days, you don't need to spend $42,000 cleaning out the ductwork and things like that. So the guide will be posted. Yeah, and just lastly, the guide will be posted on the um, Inform Green Solutions website, Turi's website. Uh, we'll, we're, we're seeking to do part two where we can update our trainings, hopefully sometime this summer. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Any other hands raised? Um, it looks like we do have one, Kevin. Or maybe not. Nope, no other hands raised. Hands raised, okay. Well, if there are no other um, folks who want to share resources at this time, um, please send them to Andy. Uh, he'll be sending out an email, obviously, with all the resources and the presentations that have been compiled. and. Uh, 
we would certainly love to get more input on this topic as as we move forward with all of our efforts um, and the i c two webpage can can be a um, a good central repository for that information. Saskia or Andy, do you have anything else you want to mention? I just wanted to call out and acknowledge Andy and thank him for um, <laughs> helping uh, make this webinar happen. I mean, basically, um, we had for you, for you, those of you who don't know, um, we had one um, person, Topher Buck, who also wanted to thank, um, you know, starting a lot of this initiative. And then um, Andy uh, took over seamlessly and uh, really helped execute this webinar and resource share. So really wanted to thank Andy and the IC2 for making this happen. Very gracious of you. Thank you, Saskia. And, and thank you to you for, for organizing the panel. It's a great discussion. Yes. Yeah, Saskia helped put this together in very, very short notice and very timely. Much needed. So thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks to all, and with that, great, great. I, we will conclude the webinar. Thanks for right. thanks for running the uh, resource share, Kevin. Thank you all. Appreciate Thank it. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.